So this morning we are talking about the balance of righteousness. We started with this thing called righteousness. Last week we were talking about a message titled The Pictures of Righteousness. But today we are talking about the balance of righteousness. Our main text has been Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 10 all the way to verse 18. But we are only going to do a few verses from verse 11 to verse 14. It says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand and stand. Therefore, having gathered your ways with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We're talking about the balance of righteousness. You say, as I was preparing this message, actually, on the breastplate of righteousness, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the breastplate of righteousness, but we're breaking it into different segments. As I was preparing for this, I could not help just remembering the mission of our church, how God called us into what we are doing today and the mandate that God has given to us. You know, when God called us to start this work, he gave us Colossians 1 verse 8, which says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect, mature, and fully grown in Christ Jesus. And then verse 29 says, the apostle Paul says, to this end, I also labor, striving according to his working that works in me mightily. So it is our responsibility to bring the right doctrine, to bring the balance of righteousness so that you may be presented perfect, mature, fully grown in Christ Jesus. You may become that perfect man. You grow into the full stature of the measure of Christ Jesus. Now, this is the reason why we are preaching this message you will see as we touch on the, 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 the text that we are using for this, that the first part, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the walls of the devil, that you may be able to stand against the plots or the deceits of the wicked one. That's why we're preaching this message, because we are living at a time where nobody knows what's, what the future holds. And the devil thinks he's winning. But let me tell you something. He cannot win against us because we have been given this armor. That is why the series we are preaching now is putting on the missing pieces to make sure that we are able to stand successfully against this time. And I want to prophesy over your life that no evil form, that no evil will befall upon you. No evil will befall you, will befall your family in the name of Jesus. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Your righteousness is of the Lord. You are born of God and you have the power to overcome the world. Whatever you are going through right now, you must know that this is but for a moment. Even as Pastor Mom said, so stand firm, child of God. Put on the whole armor of God. This is the time and the hour for us to listen to the word of God, to pay attention to the word of God like never before, to believe and trust God like never before. The Bible says that those who trust in the Lord, they are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abide forever. Abide forever. This is the time to abide. We cannot be moved by any pandemic. We cannot be moved by any recession. We cannot be moved by the report of the doctor, the report of the news. We are unshaken. We are unshakable. You and I will remain stable and fixed in what we believe. Hallelujah. This is the time for us to show how strong we are in our inner man. And if you are going through something today, I want you to know that the Lord is with you. Fear not. The Lord is with you and the Lord will settle you. All you need to do is to believe. But we're talking about the balance of righteousness and I want to try and, 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 and bring this message to you in a way, in a simple way that you will understand because there is a balance to righteousness. It's very important for us to understand that, that there is a balance to righteousness and I want to show you these two pictures. Uh, John 1, when you read John 1, verse 10 to 14, this is the what the Bible says, says, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, that's you and me, to them 
He gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name. So you and I, we are the children of God. I want us to depart from that premise. You and I, we are the children of God. And then verse 13 says, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of the will of God. So you and I, we are born by the will of God. Not by the will of men, but by the will of God. Hallelujah. And then verse 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We be, they say, yeah, he says, we beheld him, underline that, we beheld him. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. As a matter of fact, he is grace and truth. And we need to depart from that premise to understand that as the righteousness of God, you and I, we are full of grace and truth because we are full of Jesus. Everything that we do, don't do on our own ability. You see, the thing is, when we talk about, about righteousness, where the production of fruit must be made manifest, it can appear like you are, you are talking about performance in the flesh. No, you and I, we are born of God. You and I, we are not of the flesh. Remember, the Bible in the book of John 3, verse 6, it says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. When we talk about you being righteous, man, it is the spirit facts affecting your body. It is not the other way around. The performance of the flesh, it cannot be acceptable before God, even as I highlighted this last week, unless it is by the spirit of God. When we say you are the righteousness of God, what we are saying is that you are no longer living for yourself. You are no longer responsible for yourself. You are no longer producing, but the Holy Spirit is producing in you. Hallelujah. Understand that that is the Holy Spirit who is at work in your life. And I want to emphasize that part today so that you understand that when you yield to him, He's able to move in your life like never before. When you try so hard, when you look at yourself, it becomes so difficult. Remember also in the wilderness, John 3, Jesus talks about this, says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. When you look in the wilderness, what happened? They were commanded to look at the bronze serpent. Everyone who looked at the bronze serpent, they live even at this time i don't care what you are going through okay i care about what you're going through but what i'm trying to say is that if you take your eyes away from yourself and look at the master that is where the secret is that is how you cast your burdens upon him you don't cast your burdens to him and then you look at yourself you cast your burdens to him and keep your eyes fixed at him as Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Why must the Son of Man be lifted up? So that we, this generation, can look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Remember that that which is born of flesh is flesh. Before you were born again, you were born of flesh. But now that you are born again, you are no longer born of flesh. You are no longer born according to the will of man, but of the will of God. Hallelujah. I love this message because it brings a balance to righteousness. You know, last week I talked about the fact that there is no performance required in justification. Your part is to believe. Your part is to yield, is to be, you know, to obey righteousness and become a slave of righteousness. Just like before you were born again, you obeyed your nature of sin and you became a slave of sin. The life of a believer is a life of yielding. Hallelujah. And then John chapter 15 verse 2 it says every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit and then in John 15 4 he says abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine he says neither can you unless you abide in me why am I emphasizing this to say to you the production of fruit is not your function it is the function of the Holy Spirit in your life that is why I want you to be concerned if there is no results in your life. No, you cannot tell me that there is no results in your life. You are trying so hard. No, let me tell you, the word of God works for everybody who is diligent in it. And I'm going to show you today. Stay right where you are. Pay attention to this message because today you are going to move to the next level. Now, we have been using Titus chapter 3, verse 3 to 8. And today I want to read it um, in, the, in the 
Amplified Classic Edition. I think I read it. I read the, the, it in the Amplified Classic Edition last week. It says, For we also were once thoughtless and senseless. Titus 3, verse 3 to 8. For we also were once thoughtless. I want you to see, it talks about the past. We're talking about the balance of righteousness before and after. Because there is a before and there is an after. So, I want you to pay attention to that. It says, For we were, we were once thoughtless and senseless, obstinate and disobedient, deluded and misled. We too were once slaves to all sorts of cravings and pleasures, wasting our days in malice and jealousy and envy, hateful, hated, detestable, and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Savior to man, as a man, appeared, our Savior, Jesus Christ, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness which we have done. Underline that we were not saved by any works of righteousness which we have done, but because of his own pity and mercy, by the cleansing bath of the new birth, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured so richly upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He did it in order that we might be justified by his grace. He did it that we, in order that we might be justified by his grace, by his favor, holy and deserved, that we might be acknowledged and accounted as conformed to the divine will in purpose, thought, and action, and that we might become heirs of eternal life according to our hope. This message is trustworthy, and concerning these things, I want you to insist steadfastly so that those who have believed, trusted in, and relied on God may be careful to apply themselves to honorable occupations and to doing good. For such things are not only excellent and right in themselves, but they are good and profitable for the people. Now, uh, let me read Titus 3, verse 8 in the New King James Version. It says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. And then he says this, underline this part that I'm, I'm about to read. He says, these things are good and profitable to men. Hallelujah. These things are good and profitable to men, especially at this time. He says, this is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. They should be careful to maintain good works. This, I see it as Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 13, where he says, let your light so shine. It's verse 16. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me tell you something. Good works is, are very important. Not necessarily for trying to please God, but because for, for you to do good works, you must take your eyes away from you and look at somebody else. The life of a believer is a life of dependence. God touches someone to be a blessing to someone. God touches someone to be a blessing to someone. Remember, there is a scripture in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, when you read verse 28, the apostle Paul says, he's talking about something interesting there. He says, let him who still, still no more, but rather let him work with his hand, working what is good that they may have something to give to him who is without. I want you to see something here. This person is stealing because this person wants something. What he has is not enough or he does not have. That is why he's stealing. But the Apostle Paul doesn't say, let him work with his hand to have what he does not have. He says, let him work with his hand to give to him who is without. Why? Because let me tell you something. When you begin to be a blessing, you take your eyes away from yourself and you position yourself for God to be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. And I want to show you this today. How important it is to be a blessing and allow God to be a blessing to you. Let's look at something here. We are talking about the balance of righteousness, the before and the after. Ephesians chapter 2. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2, it also has the before and the after. From verse 1 all the way to verse 6, it talks about the before. It says, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh. What is the lust of our flesh? indulging and gratifying our own flesh. We were looking out to ourselves. This is the before. 
this is the before, but there is the after. He says, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, just as the others. Remember, I talked about James chapter 1, verse 14, which talks about that the fact that it is, it is our desires that opens the door for the devil to entice us. The devil uses our own lusts and our own desires to draw us away from our place of dominion, from our place of power, and he uses our evil thoughts to draw us away. Now, this scripture tells us that when we were sinners, before righteousness appeared, before righteousness was imputed, that's how we live, but not now. Because now we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live according to our own impulses, our own desires, our own thoughts. We are led by the Spirit of God. And as we are led by the Spirit of God, we are able to overcome everything that the devil can try to bring at us. Now verse 4, it says, But God, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we're dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places. That's where we are, sitting with Christ in the heavenly places. So there is the before and the after. Let's accelerate to verse 8. Verse 8, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Look at it. It's showing us that Firstly, before we were born again, we were like this. But when the kindness and the love of God appeared as a man, Jesus Christ, salvation came to all of us. We were now, we were saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And then there is a dimension that it shows us in verse 10. Verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And then it says, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Look at that. He shows us that we were controlled by Satan before we were born again. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, he saved us. Not of the works that we have done, but because of his grace. And then he says that God is the one who created us but he created us for good works. Have you ever noticed that? I want you to meditate on this scripture. The Bible says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Let me tell you something. The importance of good works at this time is that many people are being perplexed. Remember, the Bible talks about the government on the shoulders of Jesus. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the Bible says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Why, where are the shoulders? The shoulders are in the body, you and me. It is so crucial, so crucial at the hour we are living in for the church to understand that we are on this earth as a light to provide light where people do not know what to do. We have the solution. That is why God has given us the wisdom of God. That's why the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1 um, and verse 30 that Christ has been made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and redemption and certification. Jesus Christ is our wisdom, is our righteousness. So on this earth right now, we represent him. Look at Jesus when he was on this earth. He never busied, busied himself with himself. No, he was always reach, reaching out to people. That is why Acts 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Look at that, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Jesus, when he was on earth, he went about doing good. This is what we are required to do right now by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God inside us is yearning for us to become a blessing, to tell people about Jesus now like never before, to be a blessing to people now like never before, to be a blessing in your family. There are some members of our families who are only going to get saved when they see a change and a transformation, knowing us as greedy, but all of a sudden, they see us generous. They see us extending a hand. At this time, where the rate of employment is, is increasing on a daily basis, companies are considering retrenching people. They will be suffering. Others are already suffering. God has put us on this earth right now to become a difference. 
for, for as long as you're still looking at your challenges, looking at to, you know, to, to, to how you're going to take care of yourself, how you're going to take care of your children, you're trying to save here and there so that you can look for yourself. This is not how a believer should do. We are called for good works. And I want to show you a scripture. Now, last week I talked about, about something very important because this is where the balance of righteousness come in. When you look at Romans chapter 4, it talks about the fact that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So he only believed and righteousness was imputed upon him. Abraham received his justification by only believing. But then James come with another dimension where he says, Abraham was not only justified by believing, he was, he was justified also by his works that after he was made righteous, God came and demanded Isaac to see where Abraham's heart is. Pastor Steve put it right when he says, this time God is looking for the hearts. God is interested in your heart. God is not interested in the things that you do. He wants, to, man, God is interested in your heart. Demonstrate how your heart looks like. Because your heart looks like the heart of God. Your heart represents who God is on this earth. Remember the Bible says, For God so loved the world. And what did he do? He gave his only begotten son. This is the time and the hour for us to display the heart of God on this earth. So God called for Abraham to give Isaac. He was not even interested in Isaac. He was interested in Isaac's heart. To see where Isaac's heart, Abraham's heart was. And not only that. God wanted to see if Abraham depended on him, if he knew where Isaac came from. At this time, you need to know where your Isaac come from. And when God calls for your Isaac, you must give your Isaac without worry. Someone says, no, but when I gave Abraham, when he gave Isaac, God did not take Isaac. Let me tell you something. God saw, that is why the Bible says that when, when Abraham was going to the mountain, he saw God raising Isaac from the dead. In the eyes of God, Abraham killed Isaac because everything about him was pointing to death. From the moment God said, bring me now your son, Abraham saw Isaac as already given. You understand? Now, God wanted to see if Abraham understood who he was. Do you understand who you are right now? That when we say you are the righteousness of God, we mean that God is your father. You are now a child of God. Don't depend on yourself. Depend on God. This is the time for you to submit your marriage before God, to submit your business before God, to submit your finances before God, to submit your calling before God, to submit your ministry before God, to submit everything before God. Because this is the hour where God wants to demonstrate to the world that his son is alive. And for as long as we look out for ourselves, we always want to take care of ourselves. We are not a blessing to anybody. We are not representing Jesus. Jesus on this earth. This is the time. And this is not just for the pastors. This is for every righteous person. That is why we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. If you don't understand the balance of righteousness, many people are going to be so deceived, I'm telling you. I want to show you a scripture. I want to show you a scripture quickly, which this scripture bothered me so much as a young believer growing up. Bothered me so much. And I couldn't understand what this meant. I mean, man, what is, what I ask myself, what does Jesus mean by this? Matthew 7, 21, where he says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Do you know that the scripture says many are called, but few are chosen? You remember when there was a, there was a wedding, I think it's in Matthew chapter 22. In that wedding, the Bible says that the, 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 the king had a wedding for his son, and he invited many to come. Then those that were invited, they started making excuses and so on. And then he says, go to the highways. Call them to come because there is so much space. And then they went and they brought and the hall was full. The Bible says the king then went inside and he found one person in there who was not wearing a, a wedding garment. And then he went to him and said, friend, what are you doing here without a wedding garment? And then he called for his servant to take that, that man who was there not wearing a white garment. Look at this. Everyone was invited. Everybody came in. 
but this one was not wearing a, a, a wedding garment. What does the wedding garment represent? What does Jesus mean when he says, not all who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of my Father. And I want you to note something here. When he says, those who do the will of my Father, he's not talking about doing the will of, of, of the Father out of your own ability, out of your own strength. He talks about you yielding to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to be the one that performs in your life. There is such a thing as the garment, a wedding garment that every righteous person must wear representing Christ at this hour. The wedding garment is not your provision. It is the provision of God. It is the type of the Holy Spirit. You cannot do the work of the ministry without wearing that garment. You cannot stand as a righteousness of God without wearing that garment. It's like, it's like the branch that is connected. It's not, it's disconnected to the vine. That branch must be cut. And then the Bible says it with us and eventually it is cast into the sea. We're talking about the balance of righteousness. It's very important for us to realize that the, the moment we get born again, the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives. And when the Holy Spirit takes residence in our lives, we cannot remain the same. We cannot live life the way we used to live life before, controlled by our flesh, controlled by the impulses of our thoughts. No, that is what James is trying to say, to say, you are justified by faith. There is no performance required for your justification. But now that you are justified, remember, the Bible says that for those that God foreknew, he also called. For those that he called, he also justified. For those that he justified, he also glorified. It did not end with justification. There is the glorification and that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want, to, I want us to understand, especially at this time, that we are not alone. We are not orphans. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will send you another helper. If you can control the tongue, and you cannot control the tongue by what is in your mind, you cannot be effective as a believer when your word, the word of God is in your mind. The word of God has to move into your heart. When he said to Joshua, let not the word depart from your mouth, he was saying, meditate on the word. Meditate on the word. There is a blessing of the meditating man because that's where revelation comes from. At the hour like this, we need revelation. 